Hello viewers and welcome to episode 16 of Watchtower in Focus, the show that zooms in on all things JW, bringing the governing body and its teachings and policies under microscopic scrutiny. 48 hours ago, Watchtower held its 2018 annual meeting at the Warwick headquarters Particularly in recent years, the annual meetings have taken on an added significance as an occasion at which new light is revealed, changes are announced, or new publications are released. The difference this year was that rather than being simultaneously broadcast to rank and file witnesses, a relatively limited audience of some 19,000 watched the programme and was thus able to hear the latest from their leaders. Despite the increased privacy, some information has leaked out and here to discuss it with me are my regular co-hosts John Redwood and our returning newsreading colossus Covert Fade. And on this episode we are joined by a newcomer to the show, my good friend Arthur Webber, all the way over in Romania. John, Covert and Arthur, thanks so much for joining me. Thank it's you, Lloyd. Pleasure. It's a pleasure, Lloyd. Good to be here. I have news for <laughs> that. No, we need to build up to that slowly. Um, we, I feel as though the audience have been starved of your news reading genius and uh, <laughs> they need time to get used to <laughs> well if he fails to produce i've got a i've got a co-host behind me that's ready to we step do. in and do the news so you better do a good job covert scrappy the cat has returned after being chased out by a film crew in the last episode so uh, that's great now the annual meeting now if you remember last year we had loads to go on because again it was broadcast to a number of locations we managed to intercept the recording and that gave us a lot of the information that was shared this time we're basically feeding off scraps although we do have two very large scraps in terms of publications that were released and that we've literally in the last few minutes <laughs> been able to download and and go through um to try and find some highlights so that's basically what we're going to be talking about so I, again, we, we're, we're feeding off scraps, but I, I sense that of the four of us, uh, John Redwood and Arthur Webber have had a little bit more time to dwell on these scraps or have had a little bit more participation in this feeding. So I'll hand it over to you, John, to just kick us off. What, if you could summarize this annual meeting, how would you summarize it? Well, Lloyd, I, I think you made a very good point of saying that we're feeding off scraps right now because, uh, as you mentioned, last year we had uh, congregations that were tied in, and because of that, we had recordings available to us immediately, whereas this year they decided to go back to uh, their original pattern, which is to have uh, an isolated annual meeting, and then those that attend would then, you know, kind of spread the word on social media um, or word of mouth, and then Watchtower would release the publications. And so they've done that today. And um, I, I suppose the, the key thing that came out of this is that Watchtower has in the past few years been releasing certain publications through the annual meeting, and they have not released a book on the subject of Ezekiel since 1971. And they chose this Saturday to release a new book uh, about prophecy. And um, I'll see if I can pull up uh, my copy of it right here, because it's actually a little bit bigger than I expected. Um, it's 244 pages in length. And 
and we'll pull and up a copy. They're not the little books anymore, are they? They're going for the kind of magazine-shaped books now increasingly, aren't they, I've noticed? Yeah, it's interesting because they, they used to produce uh, one or two of those 192-page books as when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. Um, but they also, at the Sorry, same time, nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties. Clarify, Thank you, thank you very much, Lloyd. I appreciate that. I'm not <laughs> that old. Um, but um, so, you know, for the benefit of our viewers, and I know you have one sitting there right next to you. We have the nations shall know that I am Jehovah. How? And Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, uh, they like to focus on different Bible books at different times, particularly those involving prophecy. So in 1971, this was their expose uh, on the book of Ezekiel. And it's been all those years, close to 50 years, since they've come up with a book that gives their modern rendition of what uh, their explanation is of Ezekiel's prophecies and how they apply to Jehovah's modern day people. So uh, we have it. The book is called Pure Worship of Jehovah Restored at Last. So we're going to be showing some images later of this book and uh, some of the frightening images because, you know, we didn't have a lot of pictures back in 1971. Um, I remember studying this book uh, in great detail, and uh, my God, as a kid, you know, you, you go through this. This is a, you know, a 392. Lots of dreams went into the writing of this publication. I can, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you know, this was this was a Fred Fran special here for it was, sure. Yeah. This is absolutely, uh, you know, some of the most ridiculous things you'll ever read are in this book. And maybe if we have time, I'll read uh, maybe one quote from this book because. You know, it just brings me back to my childhood and the fact that I was taken out of playing baseball uh, to go to a book study where we would study this every week, 392 pages of question and answer an hour at the book study level. And it's just excruciating information. And it all has to do with Bible prophecy. I'm flipping through it right now. It says, when did Jehovah do so? In the year 1914 CE, when the appointed times of the Gentile nations ended on, on or about October 4th, 5th of that war shattering year. These are the kind of things contained in this book. And witnesses, you know, a lot of witnesses, I think, had a tough time with this because it was very deep, as they like to call it. So now we have this new book, which is the simplification. And I think all of us wondered exactly how far would Watchtower go in bringing back these dates, like 607 BCE and 1914? Were they going to mention these again? And I'm sure you'll comment on that and the rest mm. of the team. But oh, definitely. I was, yeah, I was surprised to find out that indeed they, they are standing firm on the year 607 is the destruction of Jerusalem. Indeed. And then, of course, 1914 is the pivotal date that Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the time of the ends the time of the end started and that the kingdom was established here on earth yeah. and that's something they haven't given up you, you would think that there would be efforts to distance themselves from uh, from that framework but they're clinging yeah. on to it for dear life let's just bring in um arthur um arthur i think you and covert um in the again in the frantic minutes building up to this recording have been you've been looking at the publications and i, I, I think yes. it's fair to say you've been looking as well at the brochure, the new brochure that's been released. Exactly, uh, exactly. What can, you, what can you tell us about that? So first of all, uh, the brochure was, uh, was released simultaneously in over 240 languages back when, when the English edition appeared in, not yet in PDF, there were 247 languages and English the 248th. And English was the last one to be uploaded to, to JW.org and uh, I was, taking like, uh, I guess it were two hours or three hours to, to wait for uh, for all of them to be uploaded in, in the background. And indeed, uh, the brochure entitled Apply Yourself to Reading and Teaching is actually a um, replacement for the ministry school guidebook, the, the benefit book. Indeed. And uh, it has 20 speech qualities uh, each on, one on each page, and uh, they are talking about uh, best practices and advice on how to how to cultivate those speech qualities. Am I right in saying that um, one big change that's been announced at the annual meeting is that they are dispensing with individual um, speech council and making it 
um, like a universal speech council that everyone is working on in the same week. Exactly, exactly. Because uh, if you check the January 2019 uh, ministry uh, life and ministry workbook for how they how they call it, yep, yeah. <laughs> MWB. That's that's how I'm used to it. Uh, they are they now have uh, the study numbers in brackets for each of the student talks. Kobe, this seems like even more of a departure from the theocratic ministry school that we grew up with, which yeah. which gave us kind of, which was really the only thing that gave us transferable skills. And I say us, I'm talking about men. It wasn't really yeah. something that helped women in any way. Um, but due to the misogyny in the organization, uh, the men received this training. And now it seems even what's even the kind of shattered pieces of the school that are left are being diminished because there's no longer kind of bespoke points of counsel for people to work on yeah i mean to be honest if i was to describe the old um theocratic ministry school as a kind of a phd in public speaking and teaching and i would agree it's, an, it's an, i found it very useful and it's actually benefited me quite a lot even as i've left the witnesses this is very much like an introductory three-week course so rather than taking like a phd in archaeology this is a pamphlet that 16 just explained to you what archaeology is now there is some good stuff in here if you're if you were to take somebody who'd never done anything like this before in their life you could hand them this booklet and there are some good points in here as to how to get started lots of you know not common sense, but lots of good tips. Okay, this is how you engage an audience. This is how you make a, a logical development. This is how you practice reading, you know. So it gives advice like, you know, read in front of a friend and get them to give you feedback. So that's all very good stuff. The problem is, this is all there is now. So there isn't anything for you to go on to after you've done this. So it would be like going to school, but rather than advancing through the ranks from a primary school to um, like if you're in the UK, a GCSE, and then onto a degree, and then onto a PhD, which you used to be able to kind of do in the theocratic ministry school, you know, get more and more personalized feedback and lots of different points of counsel. This is very kind of very simplistic. So, I mean, I would say if this was the, the first thing a witness was going to be given in their journey as a public speaker, it's a great starting point. But the problem is there's nowhere to go from here. Um, and the other thing I thought was quite funny is they, they as uh, Arthur was saying, they advise best practice. And I actually agree with a lot of what they say. For example, use secular sources in accord with the original context and the intent of the writer. <laughs> yeah, writing department. Why don't you pay attention to that? Here's, here's another good one. Avoid drawing attention to yourself by being overly dramatic, Mr. Oh, Lex. <laughs> um, here's a good one. Uh, <clears throat> Choose your words carefully. Seek to refresh, comfort, and invigorate listeners. Avoid expressions that could needlessly offend, offend them and do not speak disparagingly of unbelievers or their sincerely held beliefs. I like Morris, smashing a, a glass on the broadcast and the glass is <laughs> unbelievers. Yeah, Good. so... But yeah, Tony yeah. Morris as well. You know, he, he loves disparaging pretty much everyone who's not a Jehovah's yeah. Witness. So I think I think as is often the case that when you, even when you do find good 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 advice or good kind of um, you know good instruction from Watchtowers how to do something you'll find that the upper echelons aren't really paying attention to their own advice which is uh, unfortunate. Indeed. Now I'm going to bring in uh, John and Arthur now because before we get stuck into the prophecy book, which quite frankly was really my only uh, thing. Um, I'm, I'm always interested to know what the latest iteration of the um, <laughs> failure of, of, of interpreting prophecy is. Um, firstly, it's worth noting that there's been a lot of talk about how at this annual meeting it's been announced that Russia is the new king of the north. Of course, in the 1999 Daniel's Prophecy book, there was left some ambiguity as to who the king exactly. of the north is. And apparently at the annual meeting, it was announced that, the, that Russia is the king of the north. I was just expecting that this would be explained in more detail in the new prophecy book, but Russia is not mentioned once in the new uh, prophecy book, which is interesting. Uh, if it's such a big deal, you'd wonder why, why it's not mentioned. So I'll let either Arthur or John cut in and, and shed some light on these talks. So first of all, um, the Russia, 
Russia being the king of the north is, uh, if we dwell on it a bit uh, deeply, is not surprising at all, because uh, several decades ago, the USSR was uh, considered the king of the north. Indeed. And of and course, it's a perfect opportunity to leap on what's happening at the moment in Russia and, and um, attach great prophetic significance and kind yeah. of milk the persecution element. Complex of the, of the witnesses, of course. Indeed. Yeah, I, you know, well, I want to, you know, uh, say that what Arthur said is correct. And he, growing up in the organization from the early 70s into the 80s, you know, I studied a lot of the publications that even went back further than that. And Jehovah's Witnesses take the scripture in Daniel, which discusses a pushing or a war between this king of the north and the king of the south. And what they do is they apply that to various political entities down through the centuries. And so it wasn't always the USSR versus the Southern Bloc or, you know, the uh, democratic nations. But prior to that, it was other nations. And uh, really, they tried to bring us up to the present time. So when I was a kid and we were still experiencing this Cold War, it was something that very much got witnesses uh, goosebumps, you know, on their arms and their back because they were thinking, oh my God, this is, you know, we're so close to the end of the system of things. And the King of the North is the USSR. And we're seeing this pushing back and forth. So they took anything in the news and they tried to apply it to that template. So then, as you mentioned, we have the Daniel book, and that Daniel book sort of created this ambiguity over, uh, because, uh, you know, the USSR broke up, and we had various nations. We didn't, we couldn't really predict at that time what Russia was going to do to the Jehovah's Witnesses, but now they're really feeding that persecution complex, because we have Russia, who has you know, divested Jehovah's Witnesses of their financial means over in Russia, and told them that, you know, they basically can't meet, you know, they can still be Jehovah's Witnesses, but they can't do anything uh, like preach and, you know, uh, conduct public meetings and hold assemblies. So they've been handcuffed. And this is Jehovah's Witnesses saying, hey, um, you know, this is the king of the north fighting against the king of the south. But it's interesting, they won't put that in writing in this new book, because they don't want to get caught uh, you know, they they want to use this book for several years and they don't want to get caught making it a prediction that's going to have, leave them with further egg on their face. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that, uh, I, again, I'm trying to kind of address some of these questions that I have first, mm -hmm. but I, while we're talking about the King of the North, although <clears throat> it doesn't mention Russia, there is a paragraph about the King of the North, um, which if applied to Russia, um, makes some very interesting claims. It's on page 183, um, where it says, let's see, the King of the North, Daniel foretold the march of world powers from his day down to our time. The prophecy also mentions rival political foes, the King of the South and the King of the North, each of them having changed identity over the centuries as various earthly nations have fought for supremacy. Uh, so that dispels any confusion over whether it's a Game of Thrones reference um, regarding the final campaign of the King of the North in the time of the end Daniel said he will go out in a great rage to annihilate and to devote many to destruction Jehovah's worshippers are the primary target of the King of the North again if you insert Russia there you can kind of understand why they <laughs> reach this conclusion um, but like Gog of Magog, the King of the North comes to his end after failing in his attack on God's people. Yeah, and actually, at the regional convention, there was a, there was a statement by the by the speaker um, in the talk about the attack of Gog, Gog and Magog, and he was asking himself, uh, "Will the attack of Gog and Magog be orchestrated by the King of the North? We don't know." So there's a lot of speculation in, in Washtar theology about what's the relationship between the Gog and, between Gog and Magog as a coalition of nations and the King of the North, which is actually also a coalition of nations because it's Russia and his allies. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah, I guess it's another one of those things where we'll know more information um, as it's divulged and certainly at some point 
uh, this material will be finding its way onto um, JW Broadcasting. Actually, regarding JW Broadcasting, Arthur, you were saying something while we were while before we came on air. Yes, about uh, some developments with the website. Exactly. The, it's it's also been an announcement on on the JW.org website about this because uh, it was announced at the annual meeting that uh, the JW.org website will be revamped. And uh, let me let me quote exactly from the what's new section of of the website, and it says here that. It was also announced at the annual meeting that the governing body has approved a significant revision of our websites and applications. The JW.org website will be redesigned to include the content and features of JW Broadcasting and Watchtower Online Library. Additionally, the JW Library app will be redesigned to incorporate the content and features of Watchtower Library, as well as content that now appears only on the JW.org website. And the overall appearance of the new website and the new app will be unified and become even more user friendly. Arthur, I wanted to ask you, you know, you have a good deal of knowledge about how their system works as far as uh, watchtowers. You know, this is not just a couple of servers up in New York state and they no. are broadcasting. No. This no. is a very expensive, complicated system. Uh, exactly. Can, it's, it's can you a, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, watchtower uses a uh, cloud structure. Uh, which is rented from uh, uh, Akamai Corporation. Akamai is also uh, responsible for a distribution of content for Microsoft, Adobe, and all the other big players on the IT market. So on the same uh, infrastructure of uh, server farms, they are hosting books, brochures, Bibles, and all the literature and videos. So is it fair to say they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on this distribution network? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the the exact sums, but yeah, it's uh, there are spending spending a lot of money, but it's uh, cheaper to run than uh, printing publications, probably. Do you feel that? Is it true that it costs them money every time someone downloads something? No, no, no. no. All right, that's a shame. <laughs> but they are they <laughs> are paying license fees. <laughs> because right? because I guess I guess they have. Uh, they have a plan that doesn't include, uh, I mean, billing billing a certain amount of money for each download or each page visit or nah. Right, but 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 Arthur, would it be accurate to say that they are paying uh, licensing fees to Adobe and Apple and some of the other platforms that they use? Uh, they definitely use Adobe applications for uh, for layout and graphics. When when you when you look into these videos about uh, making off scenes and all that stuff. You, you see uh, Autodesk Maya for 3D animation. For example, Caleb and Sophia are designed in Autodesk Maya. Uh, they are using Adobe C uh, Creative Cloud in design and Photoshop for, uh, for painting and doing the layout of the publications before they are then uh, exported into maps uh, composition. And that was also revealed in um, in this latest organizational uh, uh, adjustments or uh, right. September. And there was a screenshot of uh, Adobe InDesign when the brother was uh, doing the new layout for uh, for the redesigned Watchtower Study magazine starting in January. So we know uh, they get know corporate discounts, around. yeah, but yeah, they definitely. still have to pay. You know, for each user, they have to pay us a, a small licensing fee just exactly. for that person to be able to use of Adobe course. Design and all those programs. Yeah, right. yeah, definitely. In the past, didn't they kind of pride themselves on creating their own software for that kind of thing? Uh, mm -hmm. They still use that software, but right. previously, uh, if you remember the organization behind the name video uh, there was a scene where the where the painter was using a brush and a canvas uh, to to paint a picture of for example Jesus on water and now everything is done digitally as you would expect yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, we're deviating slightly now, guys. Come on. Uh, but no, that was really interesting. Thank you, Arthur. Arthur really knows his, uh, he knows all of the cogs behind the way the publications are made. Um, so let's just go to the prophecy book, shall we? And yeah. what we've decided to do is 
uh, hand over to John, who has who's we've basically selected our highlights from the book in terms of both the most visually interesting and some interesting kind of charts and that kind of thing. So uh, we're going to try and get through them. There's yep. about thirty, I think. So yep. uh, yeah, if you give me one second, I'm going to pull that up on sure. up on screen here, and I've got to let uh, my my co-host out of the room. Yeah, you don't want yeah. Crappy wants out. Okay, thank you for indulging me there. And let's go ahead and do a screen share here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with an image of Stephen Lett. And you guys can let me know when we have that on screen. Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, so right. this is actually from page 39. And I think the point of the illustration is that uh, JW Broadcasting is an example of how the organization is, is uh, moving forward. And um, what's interesting I find is not just that, well, JW Broad Broadcasting isn't something that you can be proud of unless you're a witness and you're buying into the propaganda. Um, if you're an outsider, it's not really something to take huge pride in. But what I find fascinating, I don't know whether what you think of this covert, um, it seems as though, it seems like another example of the governing body being increasingly visible in just about every aspect of Watchtower's material. Yeah, this is, I, I find this very noticeable, and especially because coming from the era in which I was a Jehovah's Witness growing up, it was a point of pride that you didn't know who the governing body were. You very rarely saw them in publications. In fact, it was quite, I think, um, the first time I really saw them was in, I think it's the Proclaimers book or one of them. Yeah, but, but the Proclaimers book. Oh, the... Yeah, that's the one. And it was quite a, like, oh, so these, these are the governing body then. But it was quite, it was quite, I was quite proud of the fact that we didn't have, you know, leaders who are more important than everyone else. And one of the reasons we were the truth is that the, we didn't really know who the leaders were. It was godly in the organization. Well, if you flash forward to today, the governing body are very much so uh, getting their faces everywhere that they possibly can. They, they're, they, they're not always the ones leading JW Broadcasting. So we sometimes have the helpers on as well, but they're more often than not on there. And they seem to be popping up in different places as well. And this is fascinating because I don't think I've ever seen members of the governing body featured so prominently in a book release. Mm. Um, yeah. And it's not just, and I know we're, we're going to get on to, um, they, they pop up in later illustrations as well. Um, but it's the fact that they're taking for granted, they can almost take for granted now that the Jehovah's Witnesses know who the governing body is. So you don't see a little caption that says Stephen Lett, because the assumption is that everybody knows that Stephen Lett, because mm. he's got so much media exposure through JW Broadcasting. So for me, one, I, I, that's one of the things that I actually it ultimately woke me up was the increasing prominence of the governing body and the way they were being treated as people set apart from the rest of the flock, which I didn't feel was congruous to the religion I'd grown up in and to the way I understood the Jehovah's Witness, Witness faith to be practiced. So. Indeed. And, and, and frankly, anyone can build a studio and, you know, there's nothing kind of, you can't point to this and say, see, this is proof that we're God's organization because any televangelist network is, is going to have a setup like this somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, if anything, it shows how commonplace this sort of thing is. Um, maybe if we can move to the next uh, illustration. Uh, I just found this fascinating because um, it seems to be it's talking about Christendom here, Christendom's influence. Under Christendom's influence, the world sinks deeper and deeper into violence and immorality. And you have a picture there seemingly depicting not just a, a priest blessing the troops, but also a priest with a rainbow flag uh, conducting what appears to be a gay marriage. It just seems that um, the current Watchtower leadership has this real thing about going after gay people. <laughs> <laughs> any opportunity maybe it's just me yeah they're, they're very sorry I'll, I'll let someone else jump in there please go ahead no i was just saying i think this is um you can if, if you listen to all the different members of the governing body speak i suspect that this is coming from one or two people because it seems to be a recurring theme in the personal talks we hear of uh <clears throat> Anthony, Morris, 
the third. Cough, cough. Anthony Morris the third. <laughs> um, and he's the, the 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 thing that strikes me about it is that. And again, this might sound crazy, but I don't remember Watchtower being this aggressive about its um, its homophobia. It's always been anti-LGBT, um, but it seems to me like we, we had like the JW Broadcasting episode recently where a, a person, a, J, a witness turns down an armband, a, a gay support armband um, in a that shop. That was at, at the convention. At the, uh, uh, it was at the convention, yeah. 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 And, and all the shop turns on the, on the witness in this kind of snarling, rage and the witness is intimidated for standing up for the truth uh, that just wouldn't happen and it seemed a, a very kind of stereotypical almost cartoon approach that watchtower was taking to it so i i think i know it sounds crazy to say that they're ramping up their anti-lgbt rhetoric because they've always been anti-lgbt but it does feel like in the past few years they've got a lot more vocal about about um, condemning it and uh, a lot less tactful, if that makes sense. And again, mm. not to say they ever were tactful, but I do feel there's a definite, a definite rising tone of voice regarding this subject with Watchtower. Indeed. Yeah, I suspect it's also probably because uh, mainstream media is more permissive and uh, ex more open to accept diversity worldwide. Yeah, they're pushing yeah, that's back. A good point, actually. Yeah. Um, so if we move on to the next um, image, this was interesting for me. Uh, so as as many of you will know who are watching, um, Jehovah's Witnesses are unique, unique in saying that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BCE. <laughs> and this flies in the face of archaeological evidence. Um, actually, if you zoom out a little bit there, uh, John, um, it's, in, it's actually in the, um, I think it's in the paragraph. It says that there's a different way, or maybe it's on the next page, I don't know. But, but you know, by all means, stay on that page if that's the only one we have. Yeah, it's, we can go back. Um, in those pages, it gives <coughs> witnesses a second way of getting to 607 BCE. Um, and what it says is that um, the, the date can also be calculated from a prophecy in Ezekiel if you take as the starting point the division of, the, of Israel into the two different nations. So the division from, uh, of Judah from Israel, which happened um, during the reign of King Rehoboam. And it gives a date for this as like the starting point for this for this period that takes you to 607 from the other direction. Um, and I, I immediately went on Wikipedia <laughs> to see what it says about when Rehob Re Rehoboam reigned. And it gives a different date from, um, <laughs> from the one that's quoted. Does it, I think it actually does say it there on that page. It says... Um, yeah, the 390 years of Israel's error evidently began in 997 BCE, the year that the 12 tribe kingdom was divided into two parts. So it's giving their nine. Evidently. <laughs> evidently. Covers evidently, a Lloyd. <laughs> so 997 uh, BCE apparently was the year that the 12 tribe kingdom was divided into two parts but if you go on Wikipedia and look up Rehoboam it says reign circa 931 to 913 BC pretty big. Deadly, obviously <laughs> pretty big right. difference uh, you know, one thing I need to point out is we have had, as both witnesses and ex-witnesses, extensive discussions on this topic of 607 being the, uh, the date for the destruction of Jerusalem or not. And, you know, this has gone on for years, and Carl Olaf Johnson has written an extensive book called The Gentile Times Reconsidered. But here's what I want everyone to remember is... <laughs> regardless of whether or not this 607 date is correct or not. We know it not to be correct. If you were to accept that as correct, you would have to accept this day for a year rule, which brings you from uh, 607 to 1914, because they said it's 2,520 days, but it's a day for a year. 
and they base that upon two isolated scriptures in the Bible in which uh, the Israelites had been punished, and the Bible said they were punished a day for a year, a day for a year. So you have to, first of all, accept this incorrect chronology, but then you have to ex- accept this spurious teaching that means you're, you're beginning with this date in 607 and you're bringing it a day for a year all the way into our 20th century. And I think we sometimes forget that. You know, you can write all the books that you want about 607, but you have to accept this day for a year rule for any of it to have any relevance. And there's, there's really no reason for us to accept this rule. And I don't believe any other religions have that same concept built into or embedded in their theology. It's, yeah. It's just another method of Jehovah's Witnesses thinking that they are the one true faith and they have the unique understanding of scripture that no one else has. Well, actually, the day for a year principle was uh, inherited from uh, the Adventist movement. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you, like I say in my video on this subject, it's just a relic of, of 19th century eccentric ramblings of multiple preachers. Um, Yeah, and there were other people who came up with 1914 using the 2,520 years before Russell did. In fact, it was then that he got it from. So it's just astonishing. But what right. what I find fascinating That's... is is that they've they've clung on to 607, and they're also I mean maybe they've done this before in another publication that I'm not aware of. I don't know, but they've also given another way of getting <laughs> to 607. It's amazing. Which yeah, because they know they're being challenged. The yeah, they, so, they know they're being challenged on the date. And so, as you said, they're looking for another way to get there because I, I think many witnesses are going to Wikipedia and they're starting to read and recognize you can walk into any museum in the world, the British Museum or otherwise, and find evidence that Jerusalem was destroyed around 586, 587 and not 607. So here's a way of Watchtower saying, well, we're going to give you plan B uh, to prove that 607 is correct indeed and if you're going to fake a date from any point of history in any point in history you you should stay well clear of the neo-babylonian era because everything was meticulously recorded in terms of years yeah. uh moving on to the next slide um i just found this fascinating the caption there reads even in private we must avoid taking sides in this world's politics so it's not just that witnesses aren't allowed to take sides, they're not allowed to go public and speak against a certain party or a certain politician, even in private. So even in a conversation in a household, and that for me really kind of reinforces the extent to which witnesses' lives are micromanaged. I think a lot of people don't know that witnesses can't vote or per- partake in any kind of politics that came out in the Montana trial when they were interviewing the jury. And, you know, they, they just, these jury members, I think, uh, didn't express or have an understanding of Jehovah's witnesses from a political standpoint. Um, most people I've talked to don't, you know, they might know about Christmas or birthdays or the Jehovah's witnesses knock on doors, but they don't realize they can be um, considered disassociated or disfellowshipped for participating in any kind of political election. Indeed. So the next image I've saved is a bit more playful. <laughs> the majestic cedar tree. I'm sorry, I just had to include that. Um, That's your tree, Lloyd. <laughs> That's my tree. It, it Doesn't it look majestic? That's all I have to say. And um, it refers to, it's talking about the prophecy in Ezekiel that refers to the lofty cedar. So some subliminals there um, from from some Cedars <laughs> Channel fans in the art department. Well, remember, <laughs> in the shade of Jesus' kingdom rule, obedient humans will dwell in security. Of Gotta course. be obedient, Lloyd. Yeah, indeed. Well, we know that Lloyd is the antitypical cedar tree. Um, of course. <laughs> Well, in this digital actually, era. you've touched on something there, which I've, I nearly forgot, Arthur, thank you. And that's that um, there, seems, there seems to have been a trend, you, uh, seems to have been a trend in recent years of the governing body distancing themselves from the type, anti-type way of 
interpreting the scriptures. Exactly. But they're right back at it in this book. Uh, just from skimming through, you literally have them saying, well, in the uh, Bible, it means this, but in the later time period, the anti-type is this, you know. So they're right back into this way of interpreting the Bible and, and using types and anti-types from what I can see. Yes, but in a uh, lesser degree than, than previously, than, for example, in the Nations Shall Know book, because back in those days, everything was type and anti-type. And if you go to page... 238, 39, 40, there's a, there's a list of summary of clarifications. And one of the items there is, for example, uh, about do the prostitute sisters a uh, whole land or whole Oholiba figure Christendom with its division between the Catholic and Protestants, or is Christendom the anti-type of ancient apostate Jerusalem? And for example, all I opened the page on a, on the prostitute sisters and thought I might have stumbled into a very different kind of book for a moment, but <laughs> there there is indeed a section called that. <laughs> so yes, they they say like uh, conditions in unfaithful Jerusalem, such as idolatry and widespread corruption, remind us of Christendom, but we do not we do, do no longer refer to Christendom as the antitypical of Jerusalem, and. Ah. They give uh, they give a reason for it. they're changed. Ah, uh, so you so you think that it, it is they are distancing themselves yep. to a degree, even Definitely. if even Definitely. if they're still holding on to a lot of that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. okay. So there, there there are parallels between yeah. ancient times and modern times, but there are not uh, specifically type and anti-type because there are some differences in uh, okay in aspects. Interesting. So we'll move on to the next uh, picture. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of ones here. That there's a chart showing um, 607 and 1914. And there's also a chart on the next one showing 1919 onwards. And I just find it fascinating that first well we've talked about them clinging on to 607 and trying to support 607 by another means um i just find i i did a video recently about how watchtower could if they wanted jettison 1914 entirely and still maintain a lot of the loyalty because people frankly are unfamiliar with or, or a lot of a lot of witnesses are unfamiliar with the exact um the theology surrounding 1919 etc um, but here you have in this publication, they're really doubling down on 1914 and 1919, uh, which makes me think that they're never going to get rid of it. Yeah, I, I find that very interesting because, as you say, I, a lot of this stuff came from Freddie Franz and the era of Freddie Franz. Um, and the Watchtower appear to have been going through a, a stage, like you say, where they were distancing themselves a little bit from it. I mean, I actually tweeted out that I wonder what Freddie Franz would see if he could say if he saw Watchtower kind of dismantling everything he built um, because they were gradually backing away from it. So, like you say, it's interesting to see. It must be that the concepts of 1919 and 607 must be so deeply ingrained in the current, because obviously the men who are currently leading this organization came up, um, you know, as younger Jehovah's Witnesses in the era of Franz and so forth. So it must be so deeply ingrained in, in them that it's not something they've even, I mean, maybe they have thought of getting rid of it, but it, it seems clear that they've, they've, you know, doubled down quite hard because this publication isn't going to be going anywhere for a while, one presumes. Indeed. So it's interesting, and especially since, since dates have caused them so many problems in the past. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that they've, they've either not learned their lesson or that this is just so ingrained that they don't even question it. And I suspect that this is just so ingrained that they, they just don't even question it. But it's really not going to age well, is it? Oh, That's no. my point. Uh, we're already in 2018. It'll be 2019 soon. So it'll be 100 years from 1919. And well, with why, every passing year, this is going to look more and more awkward. Well, it's why the overlapping generation sticking plaster is so absurd, but it's why they had to have it. Um, mm. You know, as you say, the further we get from these dates, they need to come up with explanations and workarounds. And, and because they're working with dates that aren't correct, their explanations are always going to be terrible. 
So this, I mean, like you say, this problem is going to get worse and worse and worse for them. Um, I suppose the question is wh whether or not they'll work out that the smart thing to do is ditch the dates. But I don't think they have the creativity, and that that's yeah. demonstrated here. They they are captive to what they've they've been raised to believe, and they can't think of any. They don't. They they lack the creativity to think outside the box and come up with something different. It's astonishing. Yeah, I, I agree. You have the driving force behind these original theology theologies went back to Charles Russell, of course, and his predictions of 1914, ultimately being Armageddon, but then that was changed later to the uh, end of the Gentile times and the advent of the kingdom on earth, the invisible presence of Jesus. Then, of course, Rutherford picked up on that and he expanded on it. And then uh, the vice president, Fred Franz, at the time, you know, he he started writing all these books, including Life Everlasting and Freedom of the Sons of God, which point forward to 1975 as being the 6,000 years of man's existence ending. And that would likely culminate in Armageddon. And witnesses just, you know, went into a frenzy over that, sold their homes and with blessing of Watchtower. So um, these men are long gone and that generation is long since passed. I mean, if you look at those governing body members uh, and the helpers who gave talks on the annual meeting Saturday, you have Robert Wallen, who is, you know, very, very up in age and frail. And he's one of the final remaining members, uh, Robert and Gene Smalley, and these men who uh, were uh, deeply invested in Watchtower theology, uh, particularly Smalley, who upheld this 1914 date. Uh, you know, he was really uh, the archivist for the organization for so many years. But these men are dying off, and it does, you know, ask the question of what is it that these governing body members like Splain, who stand there with, with a pointer and points to a chart of overlapping generations and points to Fred Franz. Oh, he died in 1992. And that this means that, um, you know, it's becoming silly at this point. And, and they have gotten rid of a lot of dates. They have gotten rid of a lot of the uh, types and antitypes, as Arthur mentioned. And now they're left with a couple of real simple charts here. They've got 1919. They had already gotten rid of 1918. 1918 was the date the Watchtower officials were thrown in prison. They were released in 1918, uh, 19, and <clears throat> they had been thrown in prison because of violating the Espionage Act. They used and, to say that Watchtower was cleansed in 1918, didn't they? And then they backtracked and said, well, there's that, no reason to cleanse the organization. Yeah, that was a fulfillment of yeah. Malachi chapter 3, where mm -hmm. the true Lord came to the temple, but they ultimately got rid of that chronology and just stuck with 1919 because the officials were released. So they can point tangibly to that date and say, well, uh, Jehovah's, uh, Satan's system of things no longer has control or power over Jehovah's people. They were released from prison and therefore, and also Christendom, who they believe was controlled also by Satan, and that was influencing all of this, and, in, and especially the Catholic Church, they believe that they no longer had influence over Jehovah's people. And that's why this chart here says, uh, the faithful and discreet slave appointed to shepherd God's sheep and um, anointed ones brought together under the Messianic King, later united with a great crowd. So anyway, all of these things came together from 1919 forward where they believed that they were no longer pinned down. And that was the date that they call that uh, the, the fall of Babylon the Great. So you remember there's a fall yeah. and then there's a destruction. So they believe worldwide religion and Christendom no longer had an effect on Jehovah's organization from 1919 forward. So uh, they're still using that date. Indeed. And, and in fact, if we go to the next slide, there's a fascinating, um, yeah, there's a fascinating box that says, why 1919? Why do we say that God's people were freed from bondage to Babylon the Great in 1919? A combination of Bible prophecy and the facts of history helps us arrive at that conclusion. And I was just saying off air that I've, I've skimmed through this box. And what's interesting is that it gives the impression that there are actual biblical reasons that, that lead you to 1919. But the, the thing is, there aren't. It's just the fact that in that year, that was the year that Rutherford, <laughs> <laughs> evidently. Evidently, Lloyd. Evidently, yeah. I should, I should intersperse evidently with every other thing I say. 
That was evidently the year that um, Rutherford and his colleagues were released. That's the only reason why they choose. That's why Rutherford chose 1919, I should say, and it got passed on to successive generations. There's no, this is one thing that kind of struck me during my MTS training is that there's no actual time span in the Bible that gets you to 1919. It's literally a case of them saying, well, this is what happened in this year. Therefore, we know it's a date of significance. They're retrofitting um, events to fit the prophecy or to fit the concept. It, it's so obviously a case of them, well, this is the stuff that's happened to us, so we've got to find stuff that sort of looks maybe a bit like it in the Bible. I mean, it, it, it's once you leave once you leave the religion and look at it, it's so obvious that that's what it is. It's confirmation bias. Mm. Um, you know, well, Rutherford was released in 1919, therefore that's the start of this period of time. But as you say, there isn't actually any scriptural reason for saying that. No. You have to have the presupposition that, you know, you have to have the presupposition that Rutherford was the start of this particular period. But there's, again, there's no, there's nothing in the Bible to suggest that. And again, so it was him who dreamt up this concept that his yeah. being released from prison had significance. Which, which, if you know the man, isn't very surprising. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> And so, another word in Theocrates for this is, it's reasonable for us to believe this, oh, this and this. They're all coming out now. They're all coming out. We'll be the governing body by the end of this show. Um, Arthur was a very studious witness. He was. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, that's the other part which just mentions Rutherford. Uh, and it, it has a part where it says... Um, some who were overly attached to Brother Russell actively resisted the efforts of Joseph F. Rutherford, who succeeded Russell in taking the lead. Divisions erupted and almost split the organization in 1917. What it doesn't tell you is that it was Rutherford who grabbed power. And when people didn't like his authoritarian style of leadership, he chucked them out. That's, it's not gonna put it that way, is it? Of course um, not. If we move on to the next slide, um, yeah, this is again emphasizing 1919 and you see 607 there as well, really clinging on to this bizarre um, theology and obsession with dates. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, uh, again, the times of restoration of all things, you've got there 1914, uh, Jesus Christ enthroned as King in heaven, spiritual restoration of God's people begins in 1919 and then Armageddon, so, um, which uh, if we remember the last days between 1914 and, and Armageddon are of course referred to as a short period of time in, uh, in Revelation, not something that they seem to be referring to there. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, uh, so yeah, I just found this interesting how Charles Taze Russell is mentioned. In, in fact, if anything, he seems to be mentioned in this book a little bit more than Rutherford, which I find fascinating. Um, he is given some kind of prominence there as, as someone who pointed to Bible truths ahead of the faithful and discreet slaves. So it makes a clear distinction between Rutherford and his, sorry, Russell and his associates and the faithful and discreet slave. Of course, once it used to be that Charles Hayes was the first of the of the faithful and discreet slave, but now he's he's been demoted. You look at this illustration, and you know we talk about them getting rid of types and antitypes, but this is a perfect example of how they've taken words right out of the book of Ezekiel yeah. and said this is the type, and look at the antitype. So they quote from a rattling sound, and they use that to mean William Tyndale and others prepared Bible translations in English. So that was a type and an antitype. And then you have uh, sinews and flesh also mentioned in Ezekiel, and they compare that to mm. the anti-typical Charles Russell and his associates. Mm. Uh, that's what I that's what I was referring to earlier, by the way. That it's all the way through this book where they where they do this, and it just reminds me of it's um, almost it's almost like they're doing it, but they're not calling it types and anti-types anymore. Yeah. But it's 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 the essentially the same. We've just we've just randomly decided that this section in the Bible means William Tyndale preparing Bible translations. It's like well, really what what <laughs> show me the original arithmetic show me you're working pop the hood on this and show me all the cogs that connect a to b to c how how did you come to this conclusion it's just pure speculation indeed yeah so if we move on to the next slide i'm just conscious of time um yeah again you've got these bizarre charts oh that's right i liked i found it interesting on here they they talk about the two witnesses 
Um, so it, dry uh, bones, dry bones, dem dry yeah. bones. <laughs> so um, the the two witnesses for those who remember their Red Book of Horrors, the Revelation climax. Um, that that's it's also referred to as the two prophets, and that's described as being um, the John class or the or the anointed ones in in the last days. And not to actually, be confused with the two witness rule. Not to be <laughs> confused with the two witness rule, which you've just tried to do there, John. But I'm going to stop you because that's not where I'm going with it. <laughs> but uh, that's actually a useful um, a useful piece of reasoning to show that. Watchtower does has referred to itself as being prophets because it's they referred to in Revelation it's referred to as two witnesses and two prophets and um, of course there's the verse in Deuteronomy where it says that um, a false prophet you'll know it's a false prophet because they'll say something and it doesn't come true and then you should kill him um, <laughs> and you hear apologists say but we've never said we're prophets well that's where they say yeah, that we're prophets uh, so next slide. Uh, yeah, another governing body photo bomb. Uh, you can see there Samuel Heard. I'm, I'm managing to stay awake this time. Um, yeah, in the Kingdom Hall somewhere. But again, it goes back to what Covert was saying about how they're increasingly kind of showing themselves. Yeah. In the... like we, we can slip him into the background and we know everyone will see because that's the only reason he's there. Exactly. It's so that people can see him being there. And there's no, mm -hmm. you know, there's no other reason to put Sam Heard in that shot. So they, the, again, the assumption is that every single Jehovah's Witness knows intimately what he looks like and will pick him out. Right? Indeed. And it's probably also uh, a, a hint for, for the witnesses to picture governing body members as regular attendees of, uh, of meetings and going into the ministry yeah good point there arthur yeah it's kind of showing them as we're, we're just the same as everyone else no you're really really not uh people can literally have their have the, be ripped apart from their families for disagreeing with you and your mates so no you're not the same and if we move on to the next slide this is I love this I love this illustration. I actually I'm gonna put this on my Twitter background for a while. I think it's brilliant. Welcome to the Harlot circa twenty eighteen. This is bringing again the Revelation Climax book right up to date. And uh yeah. Um new digital artwork. Do you listen. have the other one? There's there's two pictures of this. Do you have the other one? I think we're going to show that later. Yeah, that. Oh, yeah. That yeah. is such a cute fuzzly wild beast. <laughs> <laughs> look at it. It looks like it's out of Pixar. The first the first wild beast is actually quite good, but this one, if you look at the head in the center, um, they the uh, it's kind of like in the center of the screen. It looks like a big cuddly fuzzy teddy bear. <laughs> You oh. must have grown up with very different teddy bears to the one I grew up with. <laughs> I grew up with some scary ass teddy bears. <laughs> but seriously, I'm going to make a prediction, folks. I'm going to make yeah. a prediction here that this image is going to be talked about for years as an image that has subliminal imagery <laughs> built into it. I mean, I can already see ghosts and faces. People are going to come up with and say, "Oh, Watchtower is uh, the art department is from Satan. They're involved in Masonic." masonry and subliminal imagery and uh, i'm just going to leave it at that and make that my prediction i think it will be talked about but for a different reason i think it will be talked about because it's absolutely terrifying for children it is i mean here you have a very angry beast with sharp teeth about to devour a helpless woman you know if, if you're a child flicking through this book we, and let's face it children are given these books as well and the first thing they do is look at the pictures, which is what we're basically doing. And that is going to stay in their minds. That, that you know, that's going to traumatise them. I'm sorry, it just will. So uh, very, quite disturbing artwork, I think. That scared Scrappy right out of the room. <laughs> yeah, well, he kind of left before that, but I'll grant you that. Uh, John. Well, the, the third head in the picture is actually staring right at me. No, uh, well, if you say <laughs> yeah. so. If you say so, Arthur, he's staring, <laughs> way, staring at you all the way over in Romania. So, move on to the next slide. So this is when we start to get into the kind of real doomsday aesthetic of this book. And it's going to get worse, I'm afraid, from here on in. And it really harkens to the, the kind of 
images we saw in the bunker video in 2016 and also the final video of the 2018 Be Courageous convention where you had witnesses being rounded on by people with guns. And we have it, a similar, similar uh, image in the January 2019 Watchtower. Exactly. So it really does seem to be a, like a fixation of the governing body that there are people with guns who are going to come for Jehovah's Witnesses. And it really does seem to be kind of ramping up the paranoia and, and the kind of fear mongering that witnesses are used to. Don't know what you guys think. Oh, this is funny. This yeah. is funny. So this is Gog of Magog um, surveilling Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses. <laughs> and on the screen, a picture of Sam Heard doing the JW oh, broadcasting yeah. and the Warwick headquarters and people in military uniforms kind oh, of dear. being, you know, surveilling the organization. It's just astonishing. It's like, yeah, yeah, Sam, because the CIA and NORAD military command really cares who you are. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You are the, you know, the, you know, the Pentagon is drawing up attack plans with F <laughs> fighter jets because they don't like what you've just said. Meanwhile, in, in the president's situation room, Stephen <laughs> Lett on the screen. <laughs> it really builds paranoia in Jehovah's Witnesses, and I think that's frightening. I mean, we laugh about it, but uh, when children see this and then they grow up and that's part of their education, mm. you know, they're, they're taught not to go to college, you know, and get a four-year degree, but well, the, they're, this they're is their education. Children. They're spying on children on the ministry, it looks like. It looks like there's some kids, or maybe they're adults, I don't know, but they look like children there. Yeah. In the picture. Sad. So it, 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 yeah. Sorry, after you, John. After you. No, you go. Kobe. Okay. I was just saying, the, the interesting thing is, when you are in the religion, and, and this is one of the things I think that starts to fade unless you think back, you did used to think you were the, the, the religion. Jehovah's Witnesses were the center of the universe, mm. and that all the world were aware of Jehovah's Witnesses, and that you know, Jehovah's Witnesses were constantly on the mind of people who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. And they were like, oh, Jehovah's Witnesses, those people who come preaching to us all the time and talk of this message. And what you find out is most, a lot of people just go, Jehovah who? Yeah. Oh, you mean the, the, people, the people on the car? Oh yeah, them, I never listen to them. Um, yeah. and Jehovah's Witnesses are a very, very fringe, very small religion that isn't that important on the world scene at all. And when you, one of the, that's one of the interesting things to realize when you leave is that this, this concept that, you know, the world revolves around Jehovah's Witnesses and what they do really isn't the case at all. Uh, most people maybe have heard of them, maybe talk to one at work, but it really isn't this kind of us and them eternal battle where the Witnesses are the center of, of, you know, of the universe that the, you know, that the organization likes to try and portray in its narrative. Yeah, and think about when it is that they actually pay attention to Jehovah's Witnesses. This image would have you think that, you know, the government is spying on Watchtower's headquarters and that they're after them, they're controlled by Satan. But when is it that they really pay attention to Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, it's when they break the law. They broke the law in Montana and all these other cases where they failed to, they actually told the elders not to report child abuse. And that's when the attorneys, or that's when the, uh, the law gets involved. That's when Delaware goes after Jehovah's Witnesses for failing to report child abuse. It's for not protecting children. That's when they turn attention to Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't care about what their silly beliefs are, that there's going to be Armageddon and Paradise Earth. They, they leave them alone for the most part. They allow them to preach. They even got that case in Stratton, Ohio passed so that they didn't have to get a permit to do their preaching work. That's fine. But you know, Jehovah's Witnesses have this paranoia that the world is after them, and and they're not. They just uh, want yeah. them to obey the law. Definitely. If if anything, this is what this is the irony is when you get out and you, especially if you involve yourself in activism, you realize that the outside world isn't bothered enough about Jehovah's Witnesses. They really don't care, and it's no. all we can do to get them to, uh, you know, to. Prosecute, prosecute the organization and pursue them legally, as, as John, you were mention, mentioning, it really isn't that way at all. Um, if we move on to the next slide, <laughs> we're going from the sublime to the ridiculous at this point. So that angel looks like say? he's about to lay down some fat beats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what can you say about this? He did a um, spit take. <laughs> so Kenny Rogers and his... <laughs> <laughs> look-alike friends are arms folded you know yeah like you say about to lay some smack down and uh yeah it looks like 
uh, police are out searching the neighborhood for Jehovah's Witnesses who, um, unbeknownst to them, are hiding in a bunker with a, an elaborate door knocking system protecting them from any incursion. So, uh, yeah, interesting. <laughs> beards are okay in heaven. Beards are okay in yeah, heaven. Yeah, Just heaven's FYI. the only place you can have a beard. Once you're, once you're in heaven, beard growing is allowed. Um, yeah, more fear mongering here. When his people, let's see, when his people are threatened, Jehovah will use heavenly armies to unleash his wrath. And I just think, again, you know, from a, a child's perspective, yeah. um, I just see this being terrifying. And, and kids, re kids relate to images of what things that happen to other children. Um, and so when you show kids being chased or running for cover or in this kind of threatening situation, especially in a context like this where you're because I, I mean, I don't know child psychology very well, but I know when I was growing up, I was OK with a scary story. But if you told me that story was going to happen to me, I'd be terrified. Well, Watchtower isn't saying, well, this is some you know, scary bedtime story, which is kind of a bit fun. And, you know, you're scared, but in a good way. This is like, no, this is going to happen to you. You're going to be running for your life into a house and there's going to be guys with Uzis chasing you. And it's like, that is terrifying for a child. Mm. Yeah. I see this image staying in, in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. And this is actually a double spread, um, which, John, you, it, there's another page to it. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, so that's the other half of the picture. And... <laughs> So you've got well, that's Kenny again. Yeah, Ken. Well, one of Kenny's lookalike chums. Yeah. That's like um, a ripoff of the picture in, of um, of the angel in the Daniel and the Lions Den, isn't it? Similar kind of arm spread. Yeah, I'm in control of the situation. Don't worry, guys. I've got this. Um, yeah. But this time, it's it, it's Jehovah's Witnesses clutching their New World Translation, surrounded by uh, confused soldiers with automatic uh, assault weapons because that's what they would obviously use against a pacifist uh, religious group no. um yeah here here's a guy firing into uh firing into the heavens and i just want to point out it's interesting to note that all the all the people whom god is killing at armageddon they're all being portrayed as armed soldiers yeah they really are in this one. I mean, I, I haven't seen through the book, so maybe because we're very used to pictures of Armageddon in the past, which shows no, that's that, a good point. Even actually. Children yeah. earlier, very early mm -hmm. Watchtower organization illustrations show children being killed by God. Now, this is very deliberately showing the people being killed as they've got body armor on, they've got you know assault rifles and machine guns, and there's and if you're a Jehovah's Witness, it's a lot easier to accept that God's going to kill someone who's coming after you with a gun than it is to accept that God's going to walk over and twist the head off a four-year-old child who was unlucky enough to be born to unbelieving parents. Those are two very different things. And I don't know if it's intentional, but something about the way they've really been leaning on this imagery, it tells me that they want to try and downplay the idea of, I mean, they do it all the time. They try and, they try and downplay the idea of, you know, mass infanticide and mass genocide of an unarmed civilian population. They try to phrase it in other ways. Um, and I think this is an example of how visually they're trying to kind of dance dance around the nastier aspects of this doctrine because essentially what jehovah's witnesses believe in is a worldwide genocide of you know all unbelievers um so i, I, I think, can see i think this is one of the most disturbing images that watchtower yeah. has ever produced there's so much violence in it um as, as covert mentions um people who are in line for destruction are being depicted as violent, which again, overlooks the fact that the overwhelming population of the world aren't carrying automatic weapons. Um, and also you've got this interesting thing going on where you've got, I mean, you can just see in that image, um, again, there are people to her right, sorry, to her left. You can see the girl stood motionless, which is what witnesses are supposed to do when, when it all goes down as though she'd be doing that in that situation. Yeah. I, I would, I'd be disturbed if a child reacted in that way to this much kind of violence and, um, and bedlam going on around. I think something was wrong. Um, it's almost like she has a superpower where, you know, the bullets are going to fly off of her. She's protected by Jehovah yeah. and nothing's going to happen. And also these men are killing each other. The, you can see where it says here, the attackers turn on one another. And it reminds you of their impressions of the biblical story of the Midianites, where 
um, you know, they're down in the Jezreel Valley and they all begin to turn on each other. And that's how Jehovah's people won that victory by seeing the Midianites turn upon each other and they didn't have to, you know, fire a single shot. And that's what's being portrayed here. Without, without wanting to overanalyze it, it's almost like a metaphor for the way witnesses have to um, drop their humanity or, or deny their humanity. Because no. this is not how she would be reacting in that situation. But she, it's, it's like children are being told, this is what you must be like. You must be numb to this kind of thing going on around you. And by, by extension, you should be numb if one of your family members is disfellowshipped, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, um, maybe if just quick, have another quick look at the other half. I just, I just find it a very disturbing um, artwork, and uh, we'll we'll move on because I realized. Yeah, I never realized how desensitized I was to these pictures growing mm. up as a kid because we had the Paradise Lost, the Paradise Regained book, and the Book of Bible Stories with all the violence, and that really desensitized me uh, because I always hated violence and the fact that this was supposed to be justified violence in my mind it really twisted my thinking as a child and took many years to undo that uh, before i realized man this is really wrong you don't present these kind of images to young children you would never show this to your daughter lloyd right these are Definitely. disturbing Definitely. images keep her far away from this um yeah it's a great point uh so here's another governing body photo bomb um this time the magnificent Quaff of Garrett Loesch makes an appearance. No matter what responsibility we care for in God's organization, even running God's organization, <laughs> uh, Jehovah values our efforts. So, uh, so yeah, um, just found that interesting. Apparently, watch, yeah, Watchtower has uh, no hold over him and he doesn't do anything for Watchtower. Of course, he doesn't have anything to do with Watchtower, apparently, according to a signed legal document. Yeah. And according to the Lopez trial, not only that, but he is uh, akin to the Dalai Lama of Jehovah's Witnesses, the spiritual guru and advisor of the faith. Well, if you say so. Um, <laughs> next one. Oh, crumbs. Yeah, I found these this. people at the Iron Maiden concert <laughs> got the world Jezebel on stage? Because they kind we, of look like they should be, you know, moshing. We, we move from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, those who rebel. This is, I think, in the final showdown so this is after this is towards the end of the thousand years long after armageddon and these are the rebels but what i find interesting Coba, is that you are leading the rebels if we look at the next picture there you go those who know those who know Coba will know that come with me well. my minions <laughs> I think that should be your new avatar, by the way. I just think, you know. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. So, yeah, that, this is supposed to show uh, rebels who have actually survived Armageddon and been through a thousand years of paradise, but they're clearly not happy at the end of it. And they, well, I, ju I just love the, that face that girl is making on the... Very angry, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not happy at all. It's not a good day for her. Wow. Oh, the angry like, apostate! And and it's a big, it's quite a big venue, though, isn't it? It's like a, it's like an indoor venue, isn't it? They so sold out the concert. They really, yeah. Have. I'd I'd love to know what the what the capacity is in there. It's quite impressive. <laughs> That's a health and safety violation, now. It's <laughs> <That's> terrible. <laughs> it reminds me of District Thirteen of the Hunger Games, where they're down inside the bunker, you know, and all the other uh, districts, uh, you know, are. They're, they're being controlled by the capital, and here's the rebellion, and Covert Fade leads that rebellion. And after a thousand years of humanity, they're all still wearing 21st century clothing, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, we move Very on. Post apocalyptic. <laughs> so, this yeah. is actually interesting. I mentioned about the kind of dating and about how it's 21st century, but now we move into kind of futuristic realms because there's a little bit of architect. Yeah, that's the. A chariot, the heavenly chariot of Ezekiel hovering over menacingly. Um, and there's some interesting architecture going on here. Um, if you go on, on to the next picture as well, there's a weird kind of space age kind of uh, arches happening there, mm. which seems to indicate that things are going to be dead space age and sophisticated. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether you guys interpret anything there. 
Yeah, they're trying to, because there's always been the question of how advanced will, would people be after Armageddon? And I was mm. always one of those witnesses who said, oh, it'll be incredibly advanced, we'll be all this big sci-fi and whatever. But it does kind of, it, it implies, I suppose what they're trying to imply is an advanced, happy civilization. Yeah. So when you get architecture like that, it implies, I mean, it's, it's aesthetically pleasing, but it also it's quite organic. So it's kind of fits with the foliage quite well. Yeah. So almost, you know, if I'm going to get really kind of um, sci-fi nerd, you could say, well, maybe it's kind of bioorganic technology where you actually kind of grow buildings and sculpt them. You know? um, but it, they are definitely trying to draw that picture of that paradise as a kind of aesthetically interesting and pleasing place to be, which you would want to, want it to be. I mean, the, the images I had in my head when I was a Jehovah's Witness of paradise weren't really cuddling pandas or pushing fruit around. It was more that kind of thing. Mm. I was, you know, that kind of incredible, cool sci-fi kind of, you know, 2001 Stanley Kubrick Star Trek style architecture. It was sort of something that so, went around. So head. they're distancing themselves, it seems, from the timber frame model and moving on to more advanced yeah. architecture, it looks like. Maybe. Um, I think that's it, actually. Those are all the pictures yeah, yeah. I'll show you. So, yeah, there's... <laughs> There's some interesting stuff there, but I, I guess the main takeaway. Oh, I did. I did want to share just a couple of things that weren't based on pictures. Um, there's a section on the hailstone message that uh, everyone might want to look out for. Um, let me just read my notes. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it's page 198. Uh, if you're looking, by the way, this publication will be downloadable now hopefully on the jw.org website if you go to page 198 it talks about the hailstone message it says sometime after false religion is devastated jehovah may well have his people deliver a hard-hitting message one that the book of revelation likens to a hailstorm in which each hailstone weighs about 45 pounds this message, possibly a declaration that the political and commercial system is about to end, torments the hearers to such a degree that they blaspheme God. Likely it is this message that provokes the nations into making an all-out assault on God's people to silence us once and for all. They will think that we are defenseless, an easy target to destroy. What a mistake that will be. Evidently. Evidently. <laughs> Evidently. Sorry, I didn't insert evidently enough there. Um, but yeah, the, there's been a lot made of the hailstone message, which was talked about in the in this year's convention. And it's just interesting to hear them expound on that a little bit. Um, I think it would be a mistake for them to announce that, oh, we've moved on to the hailstone message now, because then they're really kind of... I think they'd be quite disappointed because the Jehovah's Witnesses started going to the street saying, you know, God will bring destruction upon you all and they'll be expecting people to turn on them. Everyone would just kind of look at them and go, what a loony, and go on with their day. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> it's going to have the impact they think it will. Exactly. And uh, actually, those pages, uh, page 198, 199, are quite interesting because it also talks about Armageddon a little bit. It says, before they are destroyed, our enemies will see the sign of the Son of Man, likely a supernatural manifestation of the power of Jehovah and Jesus. The opposers will see things that cause them extreme anxiety. As Jesus foretold, people will become faint out of fear and expectation of the things coming upon the inhabited earth. To their horror, they will realize that they miscalculated when they attacked Jehovah's people. They will be forced to know the creator in his role as military commander, Jehovah of armies. Jehovah will no doubt unleash heavenly armies and natural forces in such a way that he protects his loyal servants but eliminates his enemies. And this is what I wanted to share with you because <clears throat> I think in a previous episode we've talked a little bit about how the governing body members seem to relish getting involved in this in the slaughter, which wasn't always part of the teaching. Well, this features a little bit here. It says, think of how keen Jesus will be to lead the charge against God's enemies and to protect those who love and serve his father. Think, too, of the emotions that the anointed will then feel. At some point before, before Armageddon begins, the last of them remaining on earth will be raised to heavenly life so that all of the 144,000 can accompany Jesus into battle. So again, it's like they're relishing <laughs> being able to participate in the slaughter. 
you know, the likes of Tony Morris, the likes of Stephen Lett. Yeah. Quite chilling. So, um, I guess that's everything. I mean, unfortunately, we ha although we have been feeding from scraps, I feel as though we've made the best of these scraps and it will be interesting to see what more details uh, are divulged in the coming weeks. We'll do our best to keep on, uh, on top of them, uh, either on JW Survey or in Watchtower in Focus. But I guess before we wrap up, it would be, oh no, we need to do... The news. We need to hear... COVID fade reading the news. We need Absolutely. to hear news reading perfection from the smooth lips of a man who we have just learned will play a key role in leading an insurrection <laughs> towards the end of the millennium. I refer, of course, to our very own Covert Fade. And Q Jingle. Okay, so um, we actually have I apologize if anyone's thinking, ah, something's happened that Covert hasn't mentioned. There's been a lot going on. So I've narrowed it down to four things. Um, but I apologize if there is other stuff that I've missed. So the first thing, let's get right to it. I was gonna, I was gonna sort of um, try and come at this obliquely, but I'm just gonna say it. Um, you went to America recently, didn't you, Lloyd? <laughs> I did go to America back in May, yeah. Did you meet any famous ex-Scientologists while you were out there, Lloyd? I met one or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might have done. The trailer has dropped. So, yeah. and this is something everyone's been very excited about. And if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, you probably know about this already. But uh, Leah Remini, um, who is a former Scientologist, who's become extremely, extremely well known um, for her award-winning show, Scientology, The Aftermath, is going to be doing a special program f focusing on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, this is something that I think a lot of XJWs, they, I think a lot of people are asking her to do it. From what I'm aware, I, I was aware that a lot of XJWs are tweeting her or writing at her saying, you, you know, you have no idea how similar the Watchtower is to Scientology and we please, we really want some exposure for this. And it's clear that that's um, something that Leah and her team looked at and realized was, a, you know, realized was something that was definitely worth doing a special on. And they did it. So in the trailer, um, I know you probably can't tell us anything, Lloyd, because you're NDA'd up to the nines. Um, but I've been buried in yeah. legal threats, not threats, yeah. but paperwork. But listen, um, yeah, I'm limited in what I can say. But the, I think what I can obviously talk about is the fact that at least I'm in it, which is obvious because it's mm -hmm. in the uh, in the um, in the trailer in the ad. But the other thing is that there are other people who you can see. So you'll have recognized, hopefully, Fifth is in there. Yep. Um, there's um, um, Nathan Flory. Sorry? Nathan Flory. Yeah, the, the, basically, there's a number of, of people who've been on the channel, on my channel, mm -hmm. who I've interviewed. So if you, uh, that's it, Shana Rubio, uh, Makesha uh, Shaley, uh, Nathan Quarry and uh, Jerry Miner as well were all on those sofas. So mm. if you want some clue as to the depth of Leah's pursuit of Watchtower, then you're going to find it by watching those interviews if you've not watched them already, because some of some of the stories there um, are very revealing of the scale of the abuse um, in Watchtower, and I was delighted. Well, I was thrilled to be involved myself, obviously, but I was also thrilled at, at the panel that was assembled because there were some really fascinating stories there. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's, I can say that because, you know, those, yeah. those faces are all there. Um, and I also want to say, and I I'm, realize I'm encroaching on your excellent YouTube. No, encroach away. Encroach away. Um, I also wanted to say that we will be doing a live stream, a Watch Tower in Focus live stream uh, the day after it airs. So um, look out for that and uh, we'll try and uh, try and dissect what's happened. So, yeah. Well done. Cool. So I think we got through that without detonating any NDAs. <laughs> so moving on, funnily enough, talking about abuse, this is, um, this, this came to the fore just a couple of days ago, NBC News in America, which is, um, Obviously, if you're in the US, you know NBC is a huge broadcaster, but for people who aren't familiar with the American media, NBC is a huge broadcaster. Um, I've run a story um, of another Jehovah's Witness sex abuse victim, Moira Smith, 
Um, you can find the details on, on the NBC website. And again, we've tweeted the links out. I'm not going to go through the details in too much. You'd be very, it's, the, it's basically the standard Jehovah's Witness abuse story. Um, and it's a shame that we can almost say the standard Jehovah's Witness abuse story. Um, that shows you how much of a problem this is. But this also makes the point that this is coming hot on the heels of the 35 million pound award in Montana, uh, where Watchtower, despite um, laws demanding that they report the abuse to the authorities, failed to report the abuse to the authorities. The other thing I was going to point out is again that we see in this um, in this particular news story we see Erwin Zalkin um, also discusses um, the way that Jehovah's Witnesses handle sex abuse. Um, and again, that he's taking, you know, he makes it clear that he's taking a lot more cases to trial. And I'm sure that this is, you know, we, we haven't seen the end of these reports. This is just going to keep going and going. And the fact that that's true is, is pretty tragic. Um, again, sticking with this particular um, theme, Reclaimed Voices in the Netherlands, um, they recently held a, a silent respectful protest outside Watchtower's headquarters in the Netherlands. But when they did this, they also handed a manifesto um, to uh, members of the government. Um, and that manifesto is published. You can see that on their website. Uh, we've all retweeted it as well. But you can actually also go and sign that manifesto if you want. So maybe, I don't know, Lloyd, if you can put the link maybe in the YouTube comments or something. But um, yeah. members of the Dutch parliament have signed this. So it, it, one of the things that's quite heartening to see in the Netherlands is how members of parliament do really appear to be on board with reclaimed voices and genuinely worried about this. So we're seeing this, the, the, the Jehovah's Witness abuse issue really gather steam across the world. And at the moment, the Netherlands appears to be one of the places where it really is coming to a head. Um, so reclaimed voices are doing absolutely fantastic work out there. I've got two more quick pieces of, uh, of news to finish with. The first one, I'm just going to read the headline. <clears throat> Naked Jehovah's Witness thought the world was ending and kidnapped people. <laughs> I was hoping kidnapping. you were going to include that. That's oh, just yeah. gold, isn't it? Well, it, I'll just I'll, I'll finish this as the naked kidnappers sped their SUV through a Canadian town while chanting Jehovah. When you say the naked kidnappers spread, yes. all sorts of things. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh. That's, that's not good imagery. Um, <laughs> Apparently, they had to be tasered several times before they could be arrested. Where, where were they tasered? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That doesn't matter thinking about, does it? <laughs> um, where were they tasered? In Canada. Why? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the interesting thing about this is when I first saw this story, um, I, I saw the story and thought, that's just weird. And then I heard an explanation come out that it said, oh, apparently they'd accidentally ingested some um, hallucinogens. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to tweet that because I, I kind of feel sorry for them. If they've genuinely, by the, no fault of their own, been exposed to a hallucinogenic episode and this has happened to them, I just feel sorry for them. But apparently what happened is the, the police are saying that's not what happened. Um, they're actually saying it wasn't hallucinogenic. They were basically just... Um, well, I'll give you a quick outline. A group of naked, yeah, a group of naked Jehovah's Witnesses who thought Armageddon was occurring kidnapped a family, forced them to chant Jehovah repeatedly while driving down an Alberta road in an SUV and displayed extreme strength while being repeatedly tasered by the cops. And they actually say that this explanation um, uh, about the hallucinogenic mushrooms isn't true. The statement, agreed statement of facts in the court, and I'll quote again, shows this may have been caused by some good old-fashioned religious fever. To be specific, the kidnappers, according to court documents with Jehovah's Witnesses, and basically goes on to say they basically worked themselves up into a frenzy, believing that Armageddon was here. They believed they didn't have time to dress, so they kidnapped a nearby family, um, forced them into a car, and tried to flee. I don't buy that. I'm sorry. Oh, I've yeah. not got time to dress. I think, I, I think, why would you be naked when you start this episode? So, so, yeah. It's so weird. It's the kind of thing where I think there must be more to this. Especially, oh, I've forgotten my clothes. Yeah, I know so it's that. so weird. So I'm yeah. I'm going to say that it it's re I do feel sorry for everyone involved because it's clearly for everyone involved that's an unpleasant experience, including the JWs who are obviously even if it was just fever, they're obviously I think there's something else mentally going on there. I yeah. feel very sorry for them. It kind but of speaks it, to the kind of mental imbalance that goes on in in cults, doesn't it? I think. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's it, it's simultaneously funny and a bit tragic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there we go. I, I just had to comment on the naked Jehovah's Witness story. You can't, you can't not I have that. that. 
Yeah. Um, and the last one is, and this is the only time I'm ever going to do this, but it's the first time I've been back on Watchtower in Focus since, is there's a new podcast on the block. It starts oh, of course. Up, Congratulations. JW yeah. Forwardcast. You can catch it on Podbean, on iTunes, and on any good podcast listening station near you, because who doesn't need more covert fade? That's the only time I'll do that, I promise. <laughs> do it multiple times, because it's a really good... Yeah, again, viewers, head on over to JW... Is it called JW Forwardcast? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's JW Forwardcast on iTunes and Podbean. Yeah. Um, no, it's a really basic good show. I, Yeah, the basic idea of the show is that we... Um, we focus on life after leaving because there's, the, I kind of feel like the, the, the grounds about leaving and about what happens before are very well covered at the moment. So what I do is I, I talk to another ex Jehovah's Witness who's also a life coach and we focus on things that affect Jehovah's Witnesses when they try and rebuild their lives. So if, if you're feeling like you're, you're curious and you'd like to check out the forward cast, that's us. See what, see what you think. No, that, that plug is much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I, I just have to marvel at, at um, what can only be described as art in the way you have dispensed, that you've introduced the news. Well, there. that's the way I'm going to whip up the, at the end of the thousand years. That's how I whip my minions up into a phrase. I just read news headlines at them until they're just baying for blood. And then, then we go charge an invisible spirit army and get slaughtered because apparently we're a bunch of morons. <laughs> Indeed, in 21st century garb. So uh, perhaps if we uh, round up, because this has gone on for much longer than I expected, <laughs> thank you for sticking with us, by the way, audience. Um, John, what are your thoughts on what we've discussed? <clears throat> well, I thought I would share with you one thing very briefly before we go. I think that this new book released at the annual meeting, we probably in 20 or 30 years will be looking back on it in the same way we look back on this Nations Shall Know Jehovah book. And I thought I'd leave with a little bit of humor here. And I call it humor because it's just something I think that was really outrageous. So I'm going to play a clip. I'm going to share a clip from this. Um, if I can share this screen. If I can share this right now, you'll see what I'm talking about. So what we're looking at is um, in the middle of this book, we have a statement about the Apollo space, space mission. This will put your mind into where Watchtower and Freddie Franz's mind was back in the late 60s and early 70s. And it says, uh, Christendom's... Religious fervor. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, Christendom's infection with the worship of false gods, the god of demonism, betrays itself very slyly. For instance, on July 20th, 1969, when for the first time a human astronaut set foot upon the moon, who was glorified thereby according to the way that scientific, the scientific group responsible for it named things that were involved, certainly not Jehovah, the creator of the moon, but the mythical sun god. How so? Because the man-made spacecraft with which successful moonshot for putting Americans on our lunar satellite was made, uh, was named Apollo number 11. Phoebus Apollo was the sun god of the ancient Greeks and was also the twin brother of Artemis or Diana, the moon goddess. This Apollo of the Greeks has been traced back as being the first king of Babylon, namely Nimrod, the mighty hunter in opposition to Jehovah. Since that first landing on the moon, further moonshots have been made in spacecrafts of the Apollo series, all a part of oh, sun worship. Wow. <laughs> that does not age well. And there it is. Oh, that is what Jehovah's Witnesses were reading in the 1970s. And I think we're going to look back on this new book with very similar derision and just we're astounded at, at what we read in these books. And it makes me wonder whether or not these new, this new young generation is going to buy into the things that, you know, the chariots and the types and the anti-types, because what we see now we're sort of expecting but to the rest of the world this is absolutely bizarre apparently neil armstrong and buzz aldrin should have traveled up to the moon on a spacecraft called jehovah and that would have been acceptable just astonishing isn't it yeah but thanks for putting this together and uh, having a chance to talk about this i, I think that we're going to have a lot more information because we have 250 pages of this new book to digest and see what they're saying but uh, we also have the new uh, publication that Arthur talked about quite a bit, uh, where they're sort of revising their school arrangement. And I think there may be some uh, reason for that beyond the reasons we've already discussed. We know that 
their Christian life and ministry meetings have to avoid being called a school because we know that Watchtower does not want the elders and ministerial servants to have to be su subjected to uh, background checks because if they do so, many of these men would not be allowed to be elders or ministerial servants because of either a criminal background or because they may have been guilty in the past of being a child molester. And over in Australia, they've passed that law, the Working with Children Act, uh, and they've revised those laws so that all of the elders and ministerial servants are required to have a Working with Children Act card. So I think that the meeting arrangement, maybe this has a little bit and I'm speculating it has a little bit to do with the further revisions of generalizing the meeting and making them less of a school environment and more of a, a general purpose meeting environment so that they don't have to have those same restrictions. Could be. And um, Arthur, we'll hear your final thoughts on what we've discussed. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really an enlightening discussion about the new developments. I mean, uh, I always look forward to the annual meeting each year to to hear about what uh, what the governing body dreams up lately, Indeed. and especially this uh, new Ezekiel book. Uh, I I read somewhere that it took ten years to compile, so it was really yeah. Because am I allowed to say how you've been kind of monitoring the the chat? On the, in in JW circles, haven't you? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And and one of the one of the posters uh, said there that it took ten years to compile this Ezekiel book. So it so it's obviously the the governing body is is boasting about uh, having researched so heavily and uh, striving to make an accurate account on uh, these prophecies and the current understanding of. Jehovah's well, it's even wisdom. Older than, it's even older than 10 years because it's basically quoting Rutherford teachings, isn't it? There's nothing yeah, really yeah. new about it, is there? Exactly. Um, Covert, your concluding thoughts? If you're still with us. So, okay. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm having some bandwidth issues. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the thing for me, I think everyone's kind of covered it. I just want to say that I think the wild beast is cute. I think it's a cute little fuzzly fuzz bunny. And it, no, honestly, it looks like something Pixar would design. Maybe I'm sick, but to me, that wild beast in the second picture is, is just, yeah, I think it's cute. Thank you for those trenchant observations. <laughs> well, it, listen, we've, we've um, I think, exhausted everything we could probably say about this, but I really do appreciate all you guys joining for this um for this show arthur joined at very short notice so i appreciate that arthur thank you very much arthur incidentally did a lot of work on my books in the designing so uh, i'm very grateful to him for that and uh, thanks as well to covert and john for joining us and uh viewers if you've enjoyed this episode don't forget that you can see more by subscribing to the john Cedars channel but that's pretty much all we've got for you uh all that all that remains is to say thank you for watching Say to the world that